So it's a great pleasure to introduce the last speaker of the symposium, Dr. Robert Schreiber. Dr. Schreiber is the alumni endowed professor of pathology and immunology and the co-leader of the Tilmo Immunology Program at the WashU in St. Louis. So Dr. Schreiber's work has been focused on elucidating biochemistry and molecular cell biology of cytokines and defining their role in in uh, immune response to, to, to cancer. So t today he will speak on using genomics to elucidate cancer immunoediting mechanisms and inform cancer immunotherapy. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. It's uh, it's a. Pleasure to be here. I, uh, I do want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to participate in what's been just a phenomenal symposium. So about 12 years ago, uh, we proposed this term, cancer immunoediting, to try and describe this complex interaction that occurs between a developing tumor and the immune system. And over the last 10 years or so, we've become quite sophisticated in our understanding of this process. We now think of cancer immunoediting as an extrinsic tumor suppressor mechanism that engages only after cellular transformation has occurred, and intrinsic tumor suppressor mechanisms like P53 or RB have failed. In its most complex form, cancer immunoediting exists in three, fa oops, sorry, three, fa three phases. The first is the phase that we've called elimination. You'll probably recognize this is a modern view of the older concept of cancer immunosurveillance, but now taking into account that innate and adaptive immunity need to work together in order to recognize and destroy tumors long before they become clinically apparent. Now, every once in a while, this process won't go to completion, and there'll be some residual tumor cells left in the host. And it's at that point that they enter the second phase that we've called equilibrium, a phase in which Tumor cells persist in the host, are unable to be destroyed, but nevertheless are unable to grow out progressively because they're being held in an in a immune-mediated uh, state of dormancy. It's in equilibrium that, that editing occurs, and I'll describe editing to you in, in a moment. Now, if the edited, editing process goes to completion and these tumor cells uh, are sculpted by their interaction with immune, immunity to the extent that they are no longer recognized and controlled by the adaptive immune system. They enter the final phase, which is called escape, in which these tumor cells now begin to grow progressively, establish an immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment, and uh, become the manifestation of the disease that we know as cancer. Now, a few years ago, we decided to try to define what the targets of the editing process were. And specifically, we wanted to ask the question whether tumor-specific antigens could, in fact, be major targets of the cancer immunoediting process. And if so, then what was the mechanism that led to the editing? So this work was largely based on a prediction that was made years ago by Jim Allison and Bert Vogelstein that since all tumors express genetic mutations, some of these could give rise to mutant proteins that could function as tumor-specific antigens, such that the immune system would see them as foreign proteins and react against them. And so the work that I'm going to describe to you today really is going to be uh, in this talk that's going to be divided into two parts. In the first part, I'll review some of our recently published studies that showed that the using cancer exome analysis, one can identify mutations in tumors that indeed give rise to tumor-specific antigens and show also that some of these tumor-specific mutational antigens can function as targets for cancer immunoediting. And then I'll finish the talk by talking about some unpublished work that we're very excited about that adapts this mechanism to use the cancer exome sequencing then for uh, use in immunotherapy. So the work that, um, that I uh, want to start with that's already been published 
focused on a particular methylcholanthrin-induced sarcoma from a 129-strain mice generated in an immunodeficient mouse uh, called D42M1. And we like this particular tumor for the following reasons. First, because it was generated in an immunodeficient mouse, it was highly immunogenic. And in most cases, when injected into naive syngenic wild-type mice, it could be rejected. But interestingly, sometimes when you inject them into a, a, a mouse, you would see that this mouse could begin to control the outgrowth of the tumor, but then it loses the battle and outgrows an escape tumor that in this particular case we call D42M1 ES3 for escape tumor 3. If you take this tumor, you harvest it, you make a cell line, and then you re-inject it into a new cohort of naive wild-type syngenaic mice. You change the, al the, you alter the growth profile of this tumor such that it now always grows in a progressive manner. And so it shows you, in fact, that we can use this kind of tumor transplantation approach to actually induce a cancer immunoediting uh, response. Now, this result suggested that D42M1 was uh, immunogenically heterogeneous. And so to look at this issue in more detail, Kazu Masushida, who at the time was a postdoc in the lab, took the D42M1 cell line and cloned it, grew up the clones, and then injected each one of these clones into wild-type naive syngenaic uh, recipients. And as you can see here, that eight out of the 10 clones shown in red maintained their high level of immunogenicity. And when injected into five wild-type mice, they were rejected in five out of five mice. Two of the clones, T3 and T10, shown here in green, uh, had a progressor growth phenotype. And interestingly, the characteristics of that growth resembled very much three independent escape tumors generated, as I've shown you, by passage through uh, immunodeficient, immunocompetent wild-type mice. And so we took this cohort of uh, clones and selected from them three of the regressor clones, two of the progressor clones, and the three escape tumors, and collaborated with our colleague Elaine Martis, the co-director of Washington University's Genome Institute, who then uh, did a, a significant level of exome sequencing uh, on these tumors and defined, to define the mutational landscape in these tumors. Now, as you would expect, because these are carcinogen-induced cancers, these cell lines, the D42M1 variants that I've described to you, all have large numbers of mutations. They have about 2,700 missense non-synonymous mutations, 90% of which are point mutations. Now, when you look at the mutational pattern in each one of these variants, you can tell, in fact, that phylogenetically, each variant is related to one another. But they do have some minor differences between one another, showing, in fact, and confirming the result that I showed you, that, in fact, these were immunogenically heterogeneous. So Matt Vesely, who was a graduate student in the lab at the time, took this data, pipelined it into these immunoepitope prediction programs, which are programs that take a look at all the MHC class 1 and class 2 epitopes, and then predict based on sequences that you input what the likely affinity of your sequence would be for the class 1 molecules. Since this is a 129-strain mice, the two class 1 molecules that we're looking at are H2D of B and H2K of B. And so when you do this, you can get an array of potential predicted epitopes, the height of which, uh, shown here, represents the uh, affinity of each of these epitopes for either H2D of B or H2K of B. And so when you look at this, of course, the first thing you say is, my God, it's so complex, I'll never get anything out of this. But as you stare at it more and more, hoping to have some message from whoever, you actually find that there are patterns here. And one pattern that was particularly interesting to us was the pattern showing that there were predicted epitopes, these examples shown here with the uh, arrows, 
that were present only in the forms of D42M1 that were rejectable. That is the parental D42M1 cell line and the three regressor clones, D42M1, T1, T2, and T9. And this would, they were not present when you looked at the progressor clones or any of the escape tumors. So this suggested that maybe there was some shared epitopes here that were relevant to the growth behavior of these tumors. And to look at this in more detail, Kazu Matsushita took a um, CTL, a CD8 T cell clone that he had generated from a mouse that had rejected the D42M1 tumor, and then incubated it in vitro with parental D42M1 or the regressor progressor clones of D42M1 or the escape tumors. And as you can see, this T cell clone recognized, again, only those forms of D42M1 capable of being rejected in wild-type naive syngenaic mice, specifically the D42M1 parental cell line and the three regressor clones. So this told us, in fact, that there was a shared epitope between uh, these uh, regressors. And so you could then go back in and filter your data, and that's very much simplified the data of just looking at the forms of uh, predicted epitopes that would be shared between uh, the regressor clones and the parental. And then we did one more filter, which was we assumed that the best epitopes would be ones that were bound poorly or not at all to MHC class one molecules in their wild type sequence. But when you added the mutation, would bind very tightly. And remarkably, when you did that, you simplified the, the, um, the, the predictions uh, incredibly, to, such that you really ended up with only two potential candidates. A mutation in spectrin beta 2 that bound to H2D of B, and a mutation in erythrocyte protein band 4, whose mutant peptide bound to H2K of B. And so how do you determine between these two? Again, you go back to your T cell clone. You look to see which form of the class 1 molecules present the relevant epitope to that clone. And you do that by inhibiting with anti-H2D uh, of B. You see you can inhibit the stimulation of that clone with anti-D of B, but not anti-K of B. And so that work led to a hypothesis. And the hypothesis then that could have all been done had Elaine been able to sequence right away, basically in a matter of a couple of weeks, that you would predict that this mutant form of spectrum beta 2 that represents an R913 uh, mutation is a major rejection antigen of the D42M1 MCA sarcoma. So the evidence that supports that this hypothesis is correct is summarized for you on this slide. I've only summarized it for you here. This is published. And so I thought the best way to present this is just a summary. But here, here are the, the four pieces of data. First, when you go back in and clone out the antigen of this C3 T cell clone using the expression cloning method developed by Terry Boone and his associates years ago, which takes months to achieve, you end up cloning out the same immunodominant epitope that you, we were able to identify in a matter of weeks using um, exome sequencing and epitope prediction. If we made tetramers from H2D of B that now carry this mutant form uh, peptide from spectrin beta 2, we can use them to identify T cells if they, uh, that enter the lymph nodes and the tumors during uh, the rejection response in these uh, mice. And you can see, in fact, that you get mutant spectrum beta 2 specific T cells that come in to both the tumor and the draining lymph nodes and get to the maximal level just prior to tumor rejection. We found a strict correlation between the expression of mutant spectrum beta 2 in the clones and variants of D42M1 and in vivo tumor rejection. And maybe the best uh, data of all is the fulfillment of Cox postulates that in fact you could take a D42M1 clone or escape tumor that now lacked the mutant form of spectrum beta 2, enforced expression of the mutant form of spectrum beta 2 in them, 
and you can change the growth behavior of them from progressively growing cells into ones that are rejected. And so this kind of work then showed us that mutant spectrum beta 2 is a major rejection antigen of D42M1 MCA sarcomas. And it also told us, importantly, that cancer immunoediting can produce tumor cells that lack immunodominant tumor-specific rejection antigens. And I want to add at this point that the um, system that we talked about using methylcholanthrene-induced uh, sarcomas that led us to this decision really paired beautifully with a, uh, a study, an independent study that was done by Michael DePage and, and, uh, and Tyler Jacks here uh, that, such that the papers were published together and I think maybe be the first time that a tumor biologist and an immunologist agreed upon the same things. And so it was, it was, it was a historic moment, I think. But in addition to that, the two um, systems yielded more information about the mechanisms underlying immunoediting and that it can occur either via an immunoselection mechanism or an epigenetic silencing of the mutant genes. And so this, I think, really sets for the first time a, a, a biochemical genetic understanding of what cancer immunoediting is. But it also primed us for the next question. And so when you think about it, you could begin to get excited by asking, can this type of analysis now be uh, adapted to identify tumor-specific mutational antigens in clinically apparent edited tumors, the kinds of tumor cells, the kinds that you actually see in progressively growing cancers, and therefore form the basis for individualized cancer immunotherapies. That could be rethinking the, the possibility that cancer vaccines made with mutant tumor specific antigens may actually have value therapeutically, either by themselves or together with the types of therapies that we've heard about today, checkpoint blockade, adoptive T-cell therapy. And so I'd like to um, spend the rest of this talk now just telling you where we are with this. So we decided to ask this question in the context of checkpoint blockade. We went back as an initial sort of model for this and took the D42M1 T3 clone that I just told you about that lacks the mutant spectrum beta 2 and the D42M1 ES3 escape tumor that also lacks mutant spectrum beta 2. And as I've told you and shown you before and as I show you here on the left side of this slide, when you inject these uh, variants of D42M1 into naive syngenetic wild-type mice, they grow progressively. So they look just like an edited um, wild-type tumor. However, if you begin growing these, and after three or four days of growth, you now start to treat these mice therapeutically, either with anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1, or anti-PD-L1, you induce the rejection of these uh, tumors in in all or most all of the cases. So um, we decided that we would use this then to study whether or not we could predict um, using this genome sequencing approach what the epitopes were that the T cells activated by checkpoint blockade were seeing that was leading to rejection. So Matt Gubin, who is a new postdoc in the lab, took six mice, injected them with um, D42M1 T3, and then at day three, six, and nine, treated half of the mice with um, antibodies that block PD-1 that were kindly provided to us by Alan Corman um, and BMS. And as you can see here, the tumors grew for a while. They remained relatively slow, but then they rejected. And two weeks after this rejection had occurred, we, occurred, we harvested the spleen from these mice put them in cultures, put the splenocytes in culture with irradiated tumor cells, stimulated them a few times, and ended up with tumor-specific T-cell lines. And so when you take these T-cell lines, again in vitro, and you incubate them with various uh, variants of D42M1, the parental, the, three, uh, the two uh, progressor clones of D42M1, and the three progressor 
escape tumors of D42M1, you can see that all three of these T cell lines see these uh, forms of D42M1. And actually, the patterns of stimulation look very much the same. But importantly, if you incubate these T cell clones with a totally independent um, MC sarcoma derived from a wild type mice, mouse, uh, F244, which is immunogenically um, uh, completely distinct from D42M1, there was no T cell stimulation. So these are really specific for D42M1. We used then the same approach that I showed you before of trying to narrow down whether or not this was restricted to one or the other of the um, class one molecules. And you can see that you can block this, you can block this stimulation, stimulation with, in this case, anti-H2K of B, but not anti-D of B. And so this to us was a surprise because we thought checkpoint blockade would have produced a very large polyclonal response, and it looks like the response is relatively restricted, at least in the context of being restricted only to a single class one molecule restriction. So we took these 2,700 mutations that we had identified from uh, the D42M1 uh, T3 and arrayed them uh, just like I showed you before, where the height of each one of these bars is the predicted binding affinity to the, um, to the uh, H2K of B. And so, again, you see it's pretty complicated. But we know from lots of work now that just prediction of binding affinity isn't sufficient. And so this took a little bit more work, and we got together with uh, Max Artemov, who actually originated here, well, he originated in Russia, but he, he got his PhD here and has now joined us at Washington University, and he can look at this data through the eyes of a bioinformatician. And Max made some changes to the way we do our predictions. And um, we ended up looking at the top 61 predicted epitopes that are arrayed for you here. As you look at them, there are four really good candidates here. And of these four, Two, we could actually almost predict would not be the case. One being a, uh, an epitope that's in a, a hypothetical Rican protein. And the other one is a protein that we would predict would not have been processed really well. So of these 2,700 mutations, we predicted that the mutant form of ALG8, which is a glucosidase, and the mutant form of uh, the laminin subunit alpha-4 or alpha-4 subunit, would be the most likely epitope seen by the T cells stimulated by anti-PD-1. And this was then uh, uh, looked at by making eight amino acid peptides that included uh, the uh, mutations of all of these 61 potential epitopes. And then we incubated each of these peptides with irradiated splenocytes uh, as feeders and the CTL74 uh, T cell line. And you can see that our prediction, in fact, hit, hit it right on the, on the button. That is, that the only two peptides here that really substantially activated CTL74 was the mutant form of ALG8 and the mutant form of LAMA4. And I'll point out to you the y-axis here, and you can see that there's a big difference suggesting that LAMA4 is actually immunodominant of the two. So um, just to show you, we went back in and then took the wild type versus the mutant sequences and repeated the stimulations. And you can see on the top, this is the stimulation for mutant LAMA4 in red and wild type, mutant ALG8 in red and the wild type form with about one nanomolar occurring right about here. So uh, these are reasonably high affinity peptides that are, whose specificity for these T cells are revealed uh, by the anti-PD-1. And so, again, we just went back in and compared CTL-74 that I've shown you with a second T cell line that had been generated from a second mouse. You see you get almost precisely the same type of pattern um, and with the same relative levels of stimulation between each of these peptides. So we're very excited about this. 
because it looks like we're on the right track. Clearly, we've got to prove to you, or prove to ourselves now, that these are, in fact, the relevant physiologic peptides that are the result in causing the, the uh, rejection. And, and we're doing three sets of experiments. One, we're making tetramers with the peptides from LAM, the mutant LAMA4 and mutant ALG8 bound to K of B, and we're asking whether we can detect T cells specific for these two mutant antigens coming into the tumors over time. And then we're looking to see can we either prophylactically or hopefully we can therapeutically vaccinate with these peptides and see if we can protect against tumor outgrowth. And the final uh, test would be to really do this now in fully edited MCA sarcomas that originate in wild type mice in which their total growth in their lifespan was uh, uh, grown up in the presence of the uh, adaptive immune system. And so I just want to take two minutes because we've got data finally on the first two parts. Some of the data came in this afternoon, or, and so it's really hot off the press. But here is the, we've decided first to focus on LAMA4 because it's clearly the major uh, epitope seen by at least the T cell lines that we're using. So here we took a cohort of mice We've put into the mice uh, D42M1T3 or F244. We let the uh, mice, the tumors form on day three, six, and nine. We treat the mice with anti-PD-1. And, um, and what you can see here in the dotted lines is that these mice will reject uh, the tumor. At day 11, which is around right about here, we take spleens, we take tumors from both mice, and we disaggregate them, and we then stain them with a tetramer specific for H2 K of B um, uh, uh, that has the mutant LAMA4 peptide. So this would be specific for a T cell receptor that sees mutant LAMA4. And you can see on the left side that at day 11, which is the peak time here, you get a clear population of mutant LAMA4 specific T cells. You don't see it in the F244 cells. And when you look kinetically, you can see that, in fact, these um, uh, T cells accumulate in a time-dependent manner and reach a maximal level just prior to the rejection of these tumors. So I think we're on the right track here. We still have to do this with ALG8. The other approach was then to take mutant LAMA4 peptide or the wild-type peptide and vaccinate naive syngeneic mice with these peptides, and then look to see whether either of them would induce a T cell response. And you can see this is an Ellie spot experiment. You can see when you vaccinate with wild type LAMA4, you don't get any T cells specific for that uh, protein. When you vaccinate, however, with mutant forms of LAMA4, you get a very strong T cell response, and those T cells can produce gamma interferon when that peptide is presented on uh, 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 syngeneic feeders. But really exciting, I think, and this is really preliminary, so this whole thing could blow up tomorrow, but nevertheless, is this data here, where we've taken these groups of mice, this group of mouse of mice vaccinated against mutant LAMA4, and then the, just the poly-IC carrier. And we've taken these cohorts, five mice in each group, we then challenged them with uh, the D42M1 T3 progressor clone. And you can see here that it's growing progressively in five out of five control mice. But it is now being rejected. Clearly, it's rejected in two out of five. And these other two seem to be turning down, so potentially four out of five mice. So this, in fact, says that we may actually be able to use this approach to predict what are good epitopes and I'm sure that one epitope is never going to make a good vaccine, but we could predict four or five epitopes in a tumor and then develop a very effective tumor-specific vaccine that could be paired either with uh, checkpoint blockade therapy or uh, even adaptive uh, T cell therapy as well. So as you can see, we're pretty excited about this, and we're really excited about it for four reasons. First, I think this approach is going to help us analyze longitudinally the cancer um, uh, immunoediting that tumors undergo either naturally or as a consequence of, of immunotherapy. 
identify the antigenic targets of checkpoint blockade therapy, maybe even use this to distinguish between patients who should be treated and who should not be treated with this type of therapy. Um, identify patients who may best benefit from other forms of cancer uh, immunotherapy. And obviously, it may bring us to what I think we all would love to see at some point, the rapid identification of specific antigens expressed in human tumors that make possible individualized cancer vaccines or other forms of immunotherapy. And so I'll end here just with uh, acknowledging the people who did the work. Uh, this is Kazu Matsushita and Matt Vesely. They did the early work on the project. Matt Gubin, who has been doing all of the work on the last part of the project that I spoke about. Uh, Elaine Martis, who's really just been key to the project and has really driven the, uh, the the sequencing effort, and of course Lloyd Old, who um, brought us into the field and um, has been an, uh, uh, an inspiration to all of us. Thanks very much for your attention. Thanks, Bob. Uh, it's appropriate to end the symposium with uh, Bob's presentation, given all that he's taught us about uh, cancer immunology and how that information can be exploited for new forms of therapy. Um, so I'm going to bring the symposium to a close. Um, as I said in my opening remarks, I was very excited about what was going to unfold today uh, because I knew, based on uh, who was speaking, that we were going to hear about some exciting new data, uh, very encouraging new data, and frankly, very dramatic data. Uh, and I think my expectations were more than fulfilled. Uh, it's really clear now that this field is moved from promise to um, clinical activity, uh, and not just occasional and not just modest, um, but very dramatic activity. Um, cancer immunotherapy is here. It's here to stay. Um, it's clearly going to be a major uh, component of the way cancer patients are treated uh, in the years to come. Uh, and many of those patients, as you've even seen today, um, will not just exhibit short-term benefit from those treatments, but perhaps lifelong benefit, which is incredibly exciting. So it's great to see the progress in this field, and I appreciate the contributions of all of you who've participated. Um, I also said that it was a good example of how cancer science and cancer-oriented engineering uh, and cancer medicine uh, can be brought together in one particular area. Uh, and indeed, I think you saw that come true through the presentations as well. Understanding how the immune system is wired, uh, using new technologies and engineering, genetic engineering, material science, nanotechnology, uh, microfabrication, and others to both understand that process and, and manipulate it in more sophisticated ways. And then, as I just mentioned, the clinical imp implementation as well is really um, phenomenally uh, impressive. This is one of the major themes of the Koch Institute. You heard from four of the six faculty members who are occupants of the second floor of the Koch Institute. Um, we've invested a lot in this area, and we're excited to watch it unfold. Uh, one person that you didn't hear from today, and I meant to call attention to him this morning when he was here, uh, was Herman Eisen, uh, who's a uh, major intellectual contributor to the Koch Institute and the second floor specifically, a real spiritual leader. Uh, Herman was, in, uh, was recruited to MIT uh, when he was already a very senior investigator. He was a chairman of his department. Uh, he was a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he was recruited to MIT to develop cancer Im immunology here. Um, and he did so over the course of his career and continues to do. And he was recruited here 39 years ago. Uh, he still comes to work. He's 94 years old. Uh, so even in his absence, I'd like to give, ask you to give him a round of applause. <laughs> so I want to thank all our internal Koch Institute speakers and all of our guests from other universities. I really appreciate your contributions to what was a terrific day of science. Uh, so if I could ask the audience to acknowledge our speakers, please. And um, we have uh, many others to thank. I mentioned a few of them this morning. Pam DeFreya, uh, Lori Spindler, uh, Daryl Irvin, Jen Su Chen, um, Anna DeConnick, 
Marta Mercia, Cindy Quince, and a cast of thousands behind the scenes who have uh, helped you get here today and taken care of you over the course of the day. So if you could give them a round of applause as well, I'd appreciate it. Uh, you heard we had many sponsors and vendors. They provided, uh, they provided uh, financial support to the symposium. We're grateful to them as well. Um, I also wanted to remind you that this is an annual event. Um, we will be here around this time next year for the 13th uh, Koch Institute Symposium for, with a topic to be named. Uh, so we look forward to seeing all of you back a year from now. Uh, and even before then, uh, we now have a fall symposium. Uh, it's the second annual. We put this on in collaboration with Cell Signaling Technology. Um, that'll be November 8th, 2013, and the title of that is Translating Cellular Signaling from Bench to Bedside. So we hope to see many of you uh, here in the fall as well. So one last thing, and here's a little bit of audience participation. Uh, there is something that you need to say at the end of this. Some of you who've been here before know that there is a reading response portion of my comments often. So the appropriate response to you is, you're welcome, Tyler. Okay, so hold on to that. Um, we appreciate you all coming out and spending the day with us. So finally then, thanks to everybody.